all sort of videos. Okay. Should have done that a little earlier. Uh, yeah, sure. It's okay. You don't need to see me. It's the plants that I'm here for. You shine no matter what. Oh, please, please silence yourself. I guess. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about Jurassic Garden, decoding how to grow prehistoric plants. Um, and I'm a paleobotanist by training, so I work with fossil plants and past ecosystems uh, for my dissertation. Uh, for my graduate work here at UC Berkeley uh, and it, with the UC Museum of Paleontology, I'm studying basically the largest mass extinction in history that happened about 250 million years ago um, at the end of the Permian period. My interest as a paleobotanist is looking at how and why forests across the planet collapsed and didn't recover for about 5 to 15 million years after this extinction. So if you think about a world without forests for about that amount of time, it's kind of strange. There's nothing like it in Earth's history. But unfortunately, that's another story and not one I'm going to actually delve into today. Instead, I'm going to talk about sort of the journey that's gotten me to this point and what I'm researching now. And I'm going to be talking about a group of plants that's very near and dear to me called Lycopod. But before I really get too far, I want to sort of address um, if how many of you here have heard of the term living fossil before? Okay, quite a few of you. Um, this is a term that's used very frequently in popular media um, to sort of describe plants and animals that are around today that look pretty much unchanged through geologic history when you look at the fossil record. Um, fossils aren't live, so the term is kind of not great on that level. But the other sort of thing to think about is that modern sorts of species of animals and plants, however you define them, are not going to be the same thing you're going to see in the rock record. And they may look very similar, but just looking the same doesn't mean that genetically you are the same. Mutation is happening all the time um, to species and individuals um, through just interactions with the external environment and through just basically propagating through time. So when you see basically these sorts of similarities in body shape, you might have what we call functional conservatism. That is, organisms don't need to change their functional morphology or appearance uh, for long spans of times because if it ain't broke, why fix it? Um, so some good examples are horseshoe crabs, cycads, and ginkgos. Um, they all are often said to be very ancient species of plants, but in fact, when you actually go through and do molecular work on any of these, actually uh, at least two of these, and probably ginkgo if we had uh, more than one species, the, the actual species that are alive today actually have radiated or have diversified very recently. Um, and you wouldn't know just looking at the morphology in the fossils, which lack DNA. So with that aside, my title is sort of misleading. I'm not necessarily growing prehistoric plants. I'm growing plants that are related to um, some of these plants we see in the fossil record. So today I'm going to talk about lycopods. Um, how many of you know what a lycopod is or have ever heard of one? All right, like maybe four or so. Good, great. You're going to get to learn about a really weird group of plants. Um, and I'm going to talk about sort of uh, my work trying to figure out how to cultivate them, which ended up being a lot more educational for me than I had expected, um, and really sort of shaped how I'm looking at uh, the mass extinctions and how plants respond to environmental stress now. Um, so I'm going to go through previous conceptions, cultivation study I did, what sort of new image of these plants came out of learning how to grow them, and a conclusion. So to start out, what is a lycopod? To sort of think about this, I want to step back and look at the evolutionary tree of vascular plants, that is, plants with water and nutrient conducting tissues. Um, so, may, most of what we see today outside are seed plants, and at that, 
flowering plants do, sort of represent most of the species we see today of land plants. Conifers, cycads, ginkgos also are in that seed plant group. But the other uh, lineages of spore plants, ferns, horsetails, and lycopods are more of interest today. And of that, just the lycopods will be my focus. So if you look at sort of the family, the sort of tree here of life, of land plants, or master plants, you'll see that right away, lycopods are actually the branch that is sister to all other uh, vascular plants that we see today. And that's really an interesting thing when we think about it because these guys go back over 400 million years into the fossil record and still are recognizable. In fact, you can compare modern species of lycopods and those that are maybe about 415 million years old, and they're actually really dang similar. It's kind of startling. Um, and we know a lot about sort of the evolutionary history of this lineage of spore-bearing plants um, because we have a rich fossil record. And defining a lycopod based on modern species is misleading because their sort of diversity was higher in the past than it is today. And I'll, I will sh sort of show more about that very soon. Um, but you can see they're quite diverse in form and function. And when we reconstruct some of these plants from the fossils, um, we get some very pl strange plants indeed. Nothing quite like what we have today. Um, this one to the right is a species that I just described with several colleagues that's about 390 million years old from Washington. Um, we call it centipede club moss because when you hack open a rock and you find it, it looks like a centipede. But um, other ones grew into towering gigantic trees over 100 feet tall, and there were some that had over six foot wide trunks, and they had no wood. So if you imagine a giant herbaceous tree that spreads spores, and for a long time we didn't even think they had roots. It's just basically this weird sort of branching plant. It's basically like something from another planet. And in fact, that's sort of what captured my attention with lycopods coming into botany, was that, wow, here's, here's a plant that if you threw it onto another planet, like an early prototype of a plant, you might get a lycopod out of evolution, or you might get a fern or something else. But these guys sort of had to reinvent or separately invent everything about them. And sort of to go back, when they diversified over you know, 400, possibly closer to 500 million years ago, every land plant that we saw in the fossil record looks pretty much like this. They had no leaves, they had no roots, they had no seeds, no flowers. They were basically green tubes that ran around the ground and photosynthesized. And you may wonder, how the heck did they get their nutrients and grow if they don't have roots or anything? Turns out in some places, these guys actually were having these symbiotic relationships with fungi, we call mycorrhiza, that basically the fungi would grow into the tissues of the plant, and through this sort of interaction, the plant was able to get sugars and some compounds from the fungus, or at least um, water and sort of transport. And the fungus was able to get at least some sugars from the plant through photosynthesis. So. Um, these guys basically were able to eat in existence. But lycopods had to set themselves apart pretty early. Um, most of these plants are about this tall, about 400 million years ago. The largest lycopod was at that time, or the first one we see is bigger than me. And we have no idea what sort of led to that gigantism in plants. So the first one we see basically predates leaves and everything in the other plants. And something interesting about these guys is that they evolved their leaves in a different way than the other plants that we see today. So on the top here is a schematic where I've taken one of those sort of naked stems of the plant and cut through it. And in the gray, we see vascular tissue. This is the plumbing that's transporting water and nutrients throughout the plant body. And it's also transporting photosynthates, sugars that are being produced by um, chloroplasts in the plant. Now, with the early sort of relatives of lycopods, we had some of these plants evolve these knobs, or these little spine 
but they have only a single vascular strand. And this is characteristic of almost all the lycopods. Whereas the other plants that we see today um, that have larger leaves, they have megaphils. And these megaphils have mul oftentimes multiple veins and are rather wide structures. And we think that they evolved based on the fossil record and intermediates that we see uh, early in the evolution of land plants. Basically evolution from a stem system as opposed to a spine that comes out. So basically stems that were three-dimensional flattened and eventually became webbed. And you have these sort of complex venation patterns from branch systems. So when we step back and look at the lycopods, over the whole of geologic history, um, a lot of them are doing rather similar things, we think, functionally. But there is quite some diversity. All of them are herbaceous, for the most part. Some of the trees might have had something similar to wood, but we don't think it's true wood at all. And they basically grew with an exoskeleton of some super hard material that we aren't sure what it is yet. It's being researched actively, I think, at Stanford at the moment. Um, but the rest of these guys are herbs. And we can see this one here is probably over 100 feet tall. Others are small, scrambling ground covers. This is all that's left today. And so if you're going to study lycopods in earnest and really understand them, you have to have a paleobotanical training to understand this lineage. Because if you try and make broad generalizations just on the living uh, species without sort of delving into the fossil record and understanding some of the context, you might get, um, you might be misled. So I'm going to talk about this group here, um, this one lineage called the Lycopodiales, um, and these are called club mosses for the most part. They're not true mosses. They have actual um, water and nutrient conducting tissues running through their bodies um, and specialized cells called tracheids uh, that allow for that water conduction. And they have roots uh, as well. So there's a couple traits that they, they don't necessarily share with mosses. Um, point for point, but some mosses do actually have water uh, movement to their tissues. So here is sort of uh, a visual interpretation of what these plants look like, the three line living lineages today, Lycopodiaceae, Pelagenellaceae, and Isoataceae. Um, and these, oddly, this one here that looks like basically an onion is the only living relative of the giant tree lycopod. And if you can imagine this, it's only about that big in size, and it grows underwater in lakes high up in the Sierras, for instance, here in California. And this is a plant where they actually have compressed the trunk into this tiny little bulb. And those are basically pieces of wood-like cork structure. So it's basically like a mini tree that grows underground underwater. And this plant is really weird if you want to think about lycopods being a strange evolutionary story in that it doesn't produce pores in its leaves or stomata when it's growing underwater. Most plants use pores or stomata to open and close and release gas, basically allow for gas exchange. Um, CO2 coming in from the atmosphere for photosynthesis and oxygen coming out for respiration. Not this plant necessarily. This guy breathes through its roots and it actually sucks up CO2 through its roots and it pumps it through gas canals through its leaves to transport. It's basically like a plant with lungs. Um, however, the story changes when you take this plant out of water and grow it on land. It ditches these leaves and produces terrestrial leaves with pores and changes its photosynthetic pathway. There's very few plants in the world that can do this. And part of my research now is looking at this plant took over the world for about five million years. One genus of these plants was everywhere. And we don't know why, but some of those sorts of tricks that's evolved might actually be behind that. So these, these plants are also ecologically quite diverse despite not having many uh, lineages left. They can occupy everything from dry sort of uh, rocky landscapes to uh, the ice weedies or quillworts that I just showed you that live underwater to ones that live in trees and rainforests. Um, some of the club mosses that I'll be talking about do that. So they're actually they're, they cover quite an ecological space today. Um, 
Now, if you were to look at lycopods, uh, one of the striking characteristics of them, besides having these tiny little leaves that are arranged spirally on them, is that their shoots always dichotomize. They always split in two. Um, and they can split in two in two different ways. They can basically be what we call isodichotomies, which are basically when two branches are of equal length uh, at every split. So like this one on the left. And there's other ones that are anisodichotomies, which are basically uneven branching. But still, at every point, there's only two branches, never three, never more. The roots do exactly the same thing. This whole plant is basically just like a tuning fork. It just keeps on dividing like mitosis on basically steroids. And the roots always dichotomize, and they do this, they have the same sort of diversity in form. Some have equal sorts of uh, branching patterns, and other ones have unequal. And that's a very characteristic, um, that trait is found in many early land plants, and the lycopods have maintained these traits to the present, which is quite interesting. Um, as I was saying, these guys reproduce by spores, um, and these spores are quite small. In fact, if you've uh, ever seen sort of early camera flashes, um, flash powder that was used for early cameras is lycopod spores. Um, they're highly flammable, and they ignite very easily because they're full of oil. But these guys basically germinate, and they have this sort of life stage called a gametophyte, that grows, lives underground. It's the sexual life stage of the plant. And it'll live underground for years, sometimes decades. And it'll produce basically this asexual part of the life cycle that we see in the greenhouse or when walking outside if you happen across one of the plants called the sporophyte, which produces the spores. They have hollowed out cavities that they develop specifically to house fungi. So they're growing their own fungi and growing their own food. And they're, if you look at them, they're really ugly. They look like some contorted alien structure when you pull it out of the ground. They're white. They might be twisted, corkscrewy, um, have all sorts of weird. Looks like a flying spaghetti monster a little bit. <laughs> but everything about these plants is weird <laughs> in some way or another, despite them being recognizable as a plant. So the diversity of the club mosses I'm talking about today, that Lycopodiaceae family, um, which is the earliest diverging uh, of these plant families today, is divided into two major groups. We call them Cuperzioids. Of course, you're going to be tested on that, and Lycopodioids. Um, these shouldn't show up too much more in my lecture. Um, so Cuperzioids, uh, making this sort of uh, distinction between these two types of sort of necessary because they defer in their ecology and they defer in their growth habit. So Cuperzioids have that equal branching pattern and they actually grow as sort of clump-like little plants. They're pretty well behaved. Um, and whereas the Lycopodioids are actually are runners, they basically have these indeterminate or indeterminate growth habits. That is, basically they grow on forever as shoots um, unless someone kills them. And they sort of uh, produce cone-like structures called stroboli that have, are basically spore cones um, that they often elevate up high above the ground to try and catch the wind and distribute their spores. Uh, Cuperzioids uh, don't, they're also producing their spore capsules up high, but they don't form cones. So some of the Cuperzioids actually are, live in trees, so these are an example here. Um, in the tropics, they, they can grow very large. They can get maybe 15 foot long sort of branches. And um, there's a guy who has one that's got about a 15 foot diameter plant in a barn or something in Australia. I mean, these things grow very large if you let them. Um, but many of them are, are imperiled uh, for several reasons that I'll be talking about soon. Um, the other group are terrestrial club mosses.
are the focus of my talk today. Um, and these guys basically are just any of these club monsters that grow on the ground. So something that's actually been um, a problem for a lot of these club monsters is that several of them have had alkaloids discovered in them or compounds uh, that are actually very potent um, at basically battling neurodegenerative disorders, such as early onset Alzheimer's. And it's been looked at as a homeopathic remedy, this uh, a component called Huprazine A. And it's been used for well over a century. Well, I mean, I think several centuries in China for a, a while, but now it's actually getting clinical trials and being looked at as uh, having a lot of potential in fighting Alzheimer's. So there's been rampant collecting in places and parts of Southeast Asia that's pretty much wiped out a lot of club moth species. I mean, they're almost extinct now in China, many of the species, because of pharmacy for the most part, which troubling because these plants, um, they grow very slowly. You can have a two inch tall little cupersioid and it might take 20 years to get that tall. And the spores, as I was saying earlier, once the spores germinate, it can be several decades underground to actually form one of those little plants. So you might be looking at a 30 year old plant. Um, and they're very easy to just pluck out of the ground and put in a bag. So it's it's really been a concern. So one of the things that at least I've been interested in was figuring out, okay, well, since these are slow growing in the wild, there's got to be a way that you can cultivate them, um, partially to deal with the conservation concerns. But for me, as um, someone interested in ancient plants and fossils, trying to develop sort of a model organism or a plant that I could use to test sort of hypotheses in the past about environmental conditions, say, at mass extinctions. They're the perfect guinea pigs for that, since they've survived all the mass extinctions and are doing basically the same thing. Um, so what sort of has prevented these plants being in cultivation so far? Why don't we see lycopods in all of our florist stores? Why don't we all know what they are? Well, I think that a lot of it has come down to what how we view these historically, and by that I mean well over a century of thinking about these plants. Um, historically, lycopods are similar to ferns in that they produce spores, and they are vascular plants. However, from there on it starts getting really iffy. Ferns and lycopods are not any closer related than lycopods and flowering plants, or conifers, or anything else for that matter in that tree I was showing earlier. So when we, while it's convenient to put spore plants together for books and publications and journals, it's actually, I would argue, destructive in the case of the lycopods because now ferns are a lot easier to work with in cultivation. We know a lot more about them than the lycopods and a lot more people study them. And as a result, we attribute what we understand about ferns to lycopod biology and we assume that lycopods play by the same rules. Problem is, they've been around about 100 million years longer than ferns, and they evolved in a very different world than ferns ever did. So, this might be a problem. So, the other thing is that, to sort of confound this, uh, a lot of the work that's been done by people trying to cultivate lycopods has been up in northeastern North America, up in New England. Uh, and in those areas, you can find club mosses growing abundantly in understories of forests alongside, lo and behold, understory ferns. So when you look at a picture like this, you go, okay, well, if I can grow that fern in this soil, I could probably grow that lycopod in the same soil. When you do that in the greenhouse, it doesn't work, actually. That fern will grow in there, but the lycopod won't. So something's wrong. Um, so when you look at accounts of people who've tried to grow these plants over time and have had sort of spotty success to complete failure, more often complete, complete failure, they usually suggest that you go by these following guidelines. You should have an organic, rich, acidic soil to grow these plants in. They like it in cool shade and moist environments, and you should never, ever 
nutrient poor, um, and so the plant shouldn't be getting much nutrients in captivity or cultivation. Um, and while they suggest these sorts of parameters, and they go by this religiously in their attempts to cultivate them, they try and sort of explain why their attempt didn't work. Okay, so those sorts of recommendations they have are what everyone else recommends. So something must be wrong um, with what they're doing. So they'll suggest that, oh, well, maybe the plants that I got were, had damaged their roots. So they're sensitive to root disturbance. They just don't transplant flat out. That's a possibility. Uh, the other thing is that, as we were just talking about with the gametophytes, we know that some parts of the life cycle are tightly knit uh, relationships with these mycorrhizal fungi. Um, sometimes mycorrhizal fungi can be very difficult to work with in a greenhouse or in a pot. Um, if you're fertilizing a plant or just in general trying to culture them, you might not be able to, to get the right mycorrhizal fungus to associate with the club moss. Um, so that's another possibility. And then environmental quality in general. Is it just that you have to have these conditions to grow them? And that could happen. So after reading a lot of these accounts uh, back in high school, I decided to start trying to grow these things as a hobby at home and eventually at the University of Washington, their botany greenhouse. Um, and I tried to take all those considerations into account. All right, got to be careful with the roots, got to keep them in an acidic, organic mix in a cold, shady place like a fern. And this looked good for about maybe a month or two. And then after these pictures were taken, they all died. They rotted prematurely. Um, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I went through about a year or two of trying to pot them up in those conditions and losing them. And I eventually got to the point where I got so frustrated, I took my last cuttings that I had and I stuck them into a pot of clay and just said, okay, just have at it. And I left them on the greenhouse bench to die. And several months went by, I didn't check on it, and the greenhouse staff kept on watering and fertilizing it. And eventually someone told me, hey, you should look at this pot over here. There's something really weird growing out of it. <laughs> and I came over, and I pulled the moss off, the moss layer, and pretty much this is about what I saw. There is like pots going crazy in there. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, this was everything against what I'd been told to grow them in. And it was in full sunlight. So everything that we had sort of um, conceptualized about these plants wasn't working. And I, and I only had one species to look at for my track record. So I decided, okay, well, this is interesting. I might as well try and see if it works for other species. So my questions again were, why mineral soils? Why, why clay? Uh, why full sunlight? Why does that work? And again, are these conducive to not only that species, but other species and other whole genera of plants in the club moss group. So I did my study at University of Washington just after that. And I sampled across pretty much the family tree of club mosses. And I got a pretty good sampling of about nine genera. Um, and these included a lot of different growth habits, as we can see. So there is some ecological diversity um, within the span of species that I selected. Um, what I found that was interesting right off the bat, I started contacting herbariums and uh, researchers all around the country, trying to find people who could go out and collect these things from the field. Again, nobody's growing them, so you've got to find somebody who can do that. When they send them to me, if I didn't get around to potting them up, immediately and let them wait a week or two, I found that they actually rooted into paper towels in Ziploc bags. And they produced really big, beefy, healthy roots when that happened. So I just, after doing that, I just plant them right into my clay mix and they'd be happy as clams. So they sort of thrive on abuse, which is <laughs> weird for such a delicate plant. Yeah, again, you, you survive five major mass extinctions and you're really hard to grow. Doesn't make any sense. How are you? That's right. Yeah, they, they puzzle me to this day. So I, I ended up developing or at least modifying this, um, this mix for them. I basically added a bunch of pumice, which is airy. Uh, 
since a lot of times if you try and grow plants in a pot or a tray in a greenhouse and you water the heck out of the medium, you get waterlogged and you can get root rot and lose your plant uh, after a while. So I tried to make the medium a little bit more um, airy and coarse. But I used basically this stuff called sandy or clay loam, which is basically a very clay uh, mix of sorts. Um, it's got a number of different sort of particulate types, maybe clays and silts, um, even a little bit of gravel going up to there, but didn't seem to matter. And I assembled basically these big trays, since a lot of these guys have runners and they need to sort of spread and expand. And I kept them basically under high humidity to let them establish. Remember, they're herbs, so they don't really have um, much protection um, to, from drying out. And they need it really wet, apparently. So basically, ultimately, we had several greenhouse benches that were dedicated just to growing these plants. Um, and we kept them in a pretty nice, uh, balmy, Hawaiian-type environment. I liked living here for several years with my hammock in the greenhouse, tending my lycopods, and I miss it every day. But that's another story. So when we looked at each sort of bench, um, I would eventually, after sort of establishing them, I'd take off these humidity domes, and I'd, we'd water the heck out of them every day and let them establish uh, into the greenhouse conditions. So everything sort of had to be really gradual um, to make sure we didn't shock the plants or dry them out too early. Um, and during this time after, so when we had this lid on, we basically didn't give them any fertilizer as they were rooting in. And it was only after they seemed like they had started to grow that we would start fertilizing. And our results were pretty good. Um, yeah, sorry for, well, basically, all of 20 species that we gr tried growing either established at the University of Washington or here at the UC Botanical Garden under the same um, regimen that I developed there. So we, everything, no matter what its ecological span, adapted or was very good at growing in this mineral soil, which I thought was very interesting. There wasn't much variation there. And this is basically eventually what our colonies started looking like basically looks like a Dr. Seuss forest in miniature um, in most cases. And these plants got, were doing so well that eventually they would reach, they'd overshoot their carrying capacity and have these mass die-offs because they basically root, basically root bound the whole pot. So there were a lot of work to keep maintained because I'd have to constantly be propagating them in different ways. So I would use, basically take cuttings of shoots and put them in those bags again, abuse them for a little while, and then plant them. And they seem to respond quite well to that. So based on what I found with sort of trying this new medium out and seeing that it worked, it sort of got me thinking about, okay, why don't I go back to their environments and look at what sort of soils these plants grow in and what conditions do they actually like? Is it, uh, is it safe to say that they're all understory plants that like to live with ferns and really rich sort of humus, or at least, um, sort of organic soils. Uh, before I did that, I started looking at, okay, what didn't work in cultivation and what were things I needed to watch out for? First, the number one thing was drying. These plants have no capacity uh, to deal with drying. If they ever basically um, go limp or rigid, so if you've ever had a house plant that you've not watered as regularly and it's gone limp, if you water it, a lot of times it'll rebound or regain its turgor pressure and function. Not like a pods. Once they lose turgor pressure, it never comes back, which is interesting. Um, ferns, ferns can actually rebound from that. Um, and it may have a lot to do with these plants. Basically, they have these pores in their leaves, these stomata, that stomata basically have these two cells called guard cells that expand and contract, that close the pore, uh, when basically you have lower humidity outside of the plant. So the plant basically moderates how much water it is losing to transpiration. Um, lycopods are not very good at this. They have a very uh, passive sort of stomata and guard cells. So even when it's super dry outside, uh, the plant does not respond in closing its stomata. It keeps them open and water just keeps on uh, evaporating through their pores. 
Um, so we had to keep these guys really well watered. This was a plant that died because we didn't water it one day in the summer. The entire colony collapsed. And so it gets, it gets pretty dicey for them. The other thing, too, is that we grew them in full light. Well, when you actually go outside and find these plants where they're doing really well, you'll notice that you know, sometimes they will grow in the shade, and many times they do. But if you compare the shade plants to ones that are growing on forest margins and out in the open, there's no comparison in terms of which one's more vigorous and robust as a plant. They are kicking when they have full light, and they like that. And that was something that I didn't see reported on in previous accounts, which I thought was surprising. Um, this is high up in the Andes and extremely high, or not uh, Andes, up in the Talamancas in Costa Rica. These plants are getting pummeled with UV radiation. I mean, they're really uh, good stress tolerators, and they hardly have any nutrients to work with in the soil here. So not really this dainty fern-like plant in the wild, and they shouldn't be treated that way. It rains every day on Zanzibar. Yes, yeah, so it stays really humid, and it's cool up there, and they get a lot of rain. That's the only reason they can hack it in that full sunlight. So not only is it that if you had a full sunlight, like a desert's not going to work for these. You have to have a lot of rain, a lot of precipitation. So there's, there's a number of reasons why you don't see these plants everywhere you know, around. And they're not common unless you hike up into mid-elevations, in a lot of cases, in mountains. Um, the other thing, too, is just looking at the soil itself. Lo and behold, when you go to a lot of these habitats, they're growing on straight clay or mineral soils. Pretty much exactly the same stuff I tried to kill my plants with was what they are used to. And I didn't see that being mentioned in a lot of um, papers prior. Um, there was one from, I think, the 1930s that basically said, oh yeah, well the only way I was able to grow this plant was to scoop up the soil from its habitat and put it in a pot. I couldn't do it with anything that was organic. And it turns out they didn't really talk about what they were growing in, but they probably just scooped up this clay. And even in those forests where these guys are growing as understory plants up in New England, if you actually dig into the dirt, you'll find that that organic layer is very thin, and the plants are actually rooted into the clay below. So they're not even using the organic stuff at all. It's totally depleted. Um, so, and they don't even seem to like shade in those conditions. Most of those forests where these lycopods do well are deciduous. They're not coniferous. If you go to a coniferous forest, they're basically nowhere in sight um, under the canopy. But um, a lot of them are just harvesting light in the winter, mostly. So the sort of conclusion from this. Um, past sort of failure in cultivating these plants, was it really because they were sensitive to root disturbance? I don't think so. Uh, because I could take plants at any sort of developmental stage. If I abused them in those bags for long enough, I could coax out new roots. So they can, they can recover uh, just fine when removed and transplanted. So really, mycorrhizal associates. Well, uh, we actually fertilize these plants regularly in the greenhouse. Um, and we had no problems. And a lot of times when you're applying lots of fertilizer to pots, you're creating a lot of competition for mycorrhizal fungi. These guys don't like to live in nutrient-rich environments, so you actually might be doing a lot of harm to them. So the fact that the plants grew well with the fertilizer to us suggested that they're not really relying on fungi to do all the work for them, and that's not really an excuse of why they won't grow necessarily. And then environmental quality. Uh, this is one that I actually do think uh, can be a, a big part of why people were not able to grow these previously. And that was because they were growing them in shady sorts of uh, damp, cold environments where they just couldn't hack it, or at least they weren't getting enough resources to grow. Um, and the other thing, too, is that, yeah, they were in the wrong soil. So that was stressing them out. Now, looking at sort of all of these factors together, the fact that these plants grow um, in these very different conditions than we thought, sort of got me to thinking back to um, when 
period what the continental configuration looked like. Very different world than today. We're south of the equator um, now, or at least where we would be standing, probably. Um, but lycopods grew everywhere at this time. They were very common. They were dominant in a lot of ecosystems then. And when you actually think about what the world was like back then, this is a world without trees, without shade, basically, aside from caves and rocks. It was completely sun, uh, sun soaked to the max. And plants were basically, we think, confined to wet sort of areas. So riparian areas are places where you have basically standing water or um, frequently wet areas. So the other thing, too, is that the evolution of soils hadn't happened when lycopods first diversified. You didn't have organic soils in the world. You had to actually have almost the advent of forests about 100 million years later or so before you actually had rich organic soil. So these plants, they already had sort of split up into their lineages that we have, that have come to the present way before we even had organic soils. So I think when I looked at sort of how all these plants uniformly were able to grow in those mineral sediments, it made me think that, hey, maybe the common ancestor to all of these living species was also used to those sorts of conditions. Um, and that's hard to sort of test, obviously, because we can't go back in the past. But we do know, looking at the fossil record and the geology of the Devonian and earlier, that these organic sort of substrates were very hard to find or poorly developed. And at that, I wanted to sort of give my acknowledgments and thanks to all the University of Washington Botany Greenhouse, the UC Botanical Garden, their staff, um, and all the individuals that have helped uh, with maintaining the plants and helping me publish these works. Thanks for your attention, guys. working on a, so we just published a paper last year on basically what I just showed all of the terrestrial lycopods. It turns out that those tree-dwelling big ones that get huge, they produce that Upper DNA as well, and in much greater concentrations than the small terrestrial ones that have been harvested traditionally. So we're now working on mass propagation, a paper on mass propagation of those so they can establish plantations of them. It actually hasn't had a lot of that really negative side effects that they've been finding, so it might have quite a bit of potential. Um, but, I mean, I think the verdict's out on that. Those, those studies have been going on, I think, a few years, and they're still, still trying to get through some of them. Um, somewhere around the East Coast, I think, is where they've been doing a lot of it now. But they've also been using it as a memory enhancer, I think, very similar to ginkgo biloba um, extract. or their hyphae, um, these sort of thread-like cells, they basically grow and intermingle with the roots of the plant in many of these cases. I think with the lycopods, um, some of the mycorrhizal associates that are with them are not really that specific. Um, so these guys will actually link or hook up to a number of different mycorrhizal associates. And actually some research that's being done here at UC Berkeley um, by 
guys are a little more general, and they'll take what they can get. Um, but I don't, I haven't done much mycology type work myself, so I'm not as familiar with the lineages of mycorrhiza that are associated with these lycopods. I believe you said that at one time this organism, this lycopod, uh, dominated the world. Uh, were they, could you guess that they were out competing them and somehow destroying the other one, or they, they just fit into the environment that they fit? So that's a really good question. And that's something we've been thinking a lot about. I guess what I left out about these guys is, so first of all, they're slow growing. Um, and being a slow growing plant that likes a lot of sunlight and a lot of water, you can imagine you're going to deal with competition because every other plant wants exactly what you want. I mean, there's maybe a cactus or something that lives in the desert. But um, you got to compete with things like flowering plants that are fast growers, really good competitors in some cases. These guys are very, very poor. Think that during these time periods where we had potentially really intense ecological stress going on, something very anomalous, something was hampering the competition. And we don't know exactly what yet, and that's sort of what we're using the living plants experimentally to figure out is what sort of conditions can lycopods deal with and persist under and reproduce that other plants can't. At that time, did you have a smaller hand? No, not quite yet. So the time when they sort of really did this uh, spike uh, it was at the end of the Permian period, about 252 million years ago. And they were living sort of in the early Triassic period, so just before dinosaurs started diversifying, um, the world was sort of resetting the stage. And this one genus or lineage of lycopods called Pleuromaya just were going like gangbusters everywhere. And their research in my lab and my advisors have been doing, have been finding that looking at the leaf bases of these plants, it looks like they were extremely slow growing. Just, it looks like they would have had, they basically have extremely tightly packed uh, interlocking leaf bases that when you look at modern plants that have that sort of dense leaves, it takes a long time if you're producing one leaf at a time uh, from the shoot. So these guys were slow growing and they somehow were doing really well. Um, so we think there's a stress that oppresses their competition. If you don't mind, another question. Sure. I will just say, what kind of animal existed during, for instance, that time? Um, so during that time, <laughs> there, there was probably a few that did, um, since they were probably one of the primary floral components these animals would have come across. There was something called Lystrosaurus that did extremely well after the Permian extinction. Um, and it had a very wide distribution. It was a small herbivorous, um, actually sort of mammal relative, if you will. It looked like a mammal-like reptile. It had tusks that might have been able to uproot, they think, plants that basically would dig. Um, which, in the case of lycopods, would work just fine because Pleuromaya basically was like a giant pipe cleaner of a plant, about my height. And it would probably bury its sort of bulbous sort of base underground, and that's where a lot of the fleshy material would have been leaking. But yeah, after that event, there sort of the early evolution of these plants for you know, well over a hundred million years or so, there were hardly any herbivores on land. Herbivores just hadn't evolved yet. There were lots of carnivores and scavengers um, around, but not many herbivores. some staying power, and they seem to be more stress tolerant than we give them credit for. Um, so for instance, those ones that live under lakes here, they actually now with the drought, I've been monitoring a bunch of populations where the lakes have completely dried out um, in ways that they haven't in many years. And the plants actually will dry to a crisp, the entire thing. If you pull it out of the ground and put it into moist soil, it'll actually rebound. Um, so some of these things have dormancy mechanisms. The club mosses are not so much able to do that. They're pretty much reliant on being in a place where germinate 
Uh, I think a lot of times the spores are sort of their key um, to surviving in some ways. They produce a lot of spores, and they're very easy to get kicked up in the wind. I mean, if you sample high up in the atmosphere in the stratosphere, you'll get lycopod spores, and they're UV resistant. And those spores can wait for long, long periods of time. They can wait, you know, centuries possibly, and until they have the right conditions to germinate, and they will do that. But I think with, with plants and climate change, one of the real keys to think about is that the microenvironment that a plant is growing in trumps everything. If a plant can find a specific location or just happen to be somewhere where it works, like a refuge, um, it might hack it. Uh, which is going to be harder with, for instance, a lot of these plants moving up mountains with the climate change. Eventually, they're going to run out of space. Um, but there are fern, the sort of fern literature and fern researchers have sort of encountered this question a lot more and have done a lot more with it. And they found with ferns that sort of we have this alternation of generations in plants. We have this gametophyte stage that's the sexual life stage, looks nothing like the adult. And then we have the sporophyte stage, it's asexual. We think about, as plant biologists, the sporophyte. What's the sporophyte doing? It's what's visible. When really the gametophyte is doing its own totally different thing under different environmental conditions. And there are gametophytes of ferns that live in caves over on the east coast that might be thousands of years old and have actually survived ice ages by living like deep in these very controlled environments. And there's no sporophytes known of these gametophytes. They just clone themselves year after year. I think that they definitely are susceptible to it. Um, I think the only reason that a lot of the lineages are like the water are still around is because they happen to find one of those niches or microenvironments. And that's sort of the tricky thing with the fossil record is that we have a very patchy sort of record. I mean, we only have a few sites for something like that whole mass extinction. There might be 20 sites around the world that are known in that time. Just because you don't see the plant in that spot doesn't mean it's eking its existence somewhere else. Um, so I think that microenvironment thing is, is one thing. The other thing, sorry, your question about climate change in the past and getting warming events, the time when those lycopods took over the world was a super greenhouse event, which is really weird because that's not when we'd expect these plants to be doing well. Um, we still don't know why they were doing well in, under those conditions, but um, it might be that they were able to switch their their photosynthetic metabolism regardless, or at least based on what environment they were living in. If they were living in desert oases that would dry up, they basically would change the way they breathe, or at least photosynthesize when the water runs out, possibly. Um, still a mystery, though. Um, to the food chain, um, but a lot of times, so the weird thing is sort of when the land was getting invaded back you know, in the Devonian period or so, about maybe 500 million years ago prior to that, the first animals we see in the fossil record, they're all carnivores on land. And there's been, I think, hypotheses based on that saying that, hey, they're feeding off of basically detritus and like meat that's washing up dead animals and carcasses that come up on shore. And they're also eating, I mean, they eat each other, too. I mean, being a carnivore, it's cheaper and easier. I mean, you don't have to have as nearly as efficient a gut. You don't have to support a whole microbiota that can digest plant material. Um, so for them, it was sort of easier for a long time. It's still sort of a mystery of why it took so long for herbivores to really show up in the fossil record. We have, I think, just maybe a handful of bite marks in fossil plants from around the world for that first 100 million years of land plant evolution. Nothing, hardly anything's eating them. Um, we're not quite sure. 
are definitely those holes in the record, and it's a very patchy one at that. There has been a lot of research that's been done on coprolites, fossilized excrement of animals, and we have a very wide sampling that corresponds with pretty much everything that we have um, what we call macrofossils of, or body fossils of. We have basically coprolites that seem to go toward those. And in those coprolites, we very rarely find what would have been like fresh plant material we do find spores occasionally um, in there. And it's not sh certain whether the animals were eating those spores deliberately or by chance. And there were, more recently, there have been some discoveries of intact um, plants uh, at a site called the Rhiney Chert. Um, so, so a lot of what we know about the early ecosystems actually comes from one site at that. And this place, uh, called the Rainy Shirt, up, I think in Scotland, basically is a hot springs deposit where basically these, this whole ecosystem was frozen in time because it was um, basically bathed in superheated waters that were rich in silica that precipitated. And so you get cellular level preservation in everything that's there. And everything is in situ, so it basically is in life position. But you can actually find when you dissect these fossil plants that are about two centimeters tall sometimes and look inside their spore capsules, you can find mites in there with their sheds, excrement, and also, you know, spores. And you think that those were eating them. Um, but because at that site, which is, there's quite a bit of material there, and people have been looking for damage in this in situ sort of Pompeii situation, and it's really startling how little damage. There's parasitism going there's nematodes. You can find tiny little microscopic nematode worms fossilized, even mating and laying eggs frozen in the cells of some of these plants. It's that well preserved. Um, so we actually have a pretty good idea, at least on that site level, what might have been going on in some of the weird uh, cases. But it's a really good point you bring up, and that's definitely a possibility. Yeah, absolutely. So that's something too. Um, so today, the plants that we have and we rely on eating, most of the plants are flowering plants that we go after. We use conifers and gins and a couple uh, liqueurs. And we don't really rely on ferns and lycopods as much. We can eat fiddlehead. Lycopods themselves are actually pretty toxic. So hardly anything eats them even today, uh, except for some of the late ones, ducks like to go after them. Um, but the nutritional value is thought to have been pretty low in a lot of early land plants and going even into the dinosaur days. But at the same time, when you do look at coprolites of dinosaurs, you'll actually find that, yeah, they were chowing down on conifers and ferns and things like that. They, and these were gigantic sauropods. They were subsisting off of that. So I, it may be that some of these plant lineages earlier actually did have higher nutrients nutritional value than their living descendants do today. Um, yeah. Yes. So that was one of the nice things, or at least the more pleasant surprises for me, is that I could go outside in a lot of different places, um, and I could collect sort of clay soil under, say, out of a construction site or on a logging road or uh, a mudslide area. And usually the lycopods will take to it. They don't, they don't seem to have much of a, a, a specificity for it. There are places, though, like if I get clay from a fossil site where I've got extremely high calcium carbon in, in it, they'll die when they try and grow in that. But it also turns into silly putty, basically, and suffocates their roots. So. trying to see whether it's made of mineral. And that silica, a lot of plants actually take up silica to their roots that's soluble in groundwater, and they precipitate in their tissues. So horsetails, 
hills in South America that grow 15 feet tall, but they're total herbs and they have very rigid sort of um, silicaceous exoskeleton. We don't think that that's probably what's going on with these guys, but the interesting thing is when you go to coal deposits, those trees make up an enormous amount of world's coal. So believe it or not, lycopods are changing the climate right now. <laughs> they're here to stay. But uh, you can find these massive logs, just log jams of these trees, and they never look, they hardly ever seem to be that well degraded. And when you see the sort of giant root structures that are going through there, roots never, of other lycopod trees, can never penetrate through the stumps because they always grow up, around, or under. So it's possible that, and also at the time that these trees were growing, just as a random fact, like the CO2 levels were at basically an all-time low. Um, so this was the Carboniferous or the Coal Age. You had giant, you know, dragonflies that big. Um, basically, it's thought there was a 